worrying. And what's worse, as a society, we seem happy to tolerate such ignorance. I've noticed a double standard in our society with respect to science. Earlier this year, I was on a late-night television talk show, and I mentioned the names of Watson and Crick. And the chairman promptly stopped me and said, for the benefit of viewers, who are Watson and Crick? Now, if I'd said I'd just be into the Cezanne exhibition, she wouldn't have dreamed of saying, for the benefit of viewers, who was Cezanne. And that double standard matters. Not that we should value Cezanne less, but we should seek to value science more. No one knows that better than that great messenger of science, Sir David Attenborough. Now I'm getting up into the canopy, into the world of the birds of paradise. He feels strongly that a practical knowledge of science and its uses would benefit everybody. And here's the top. The birds are in another emergent tree, just like this one, and I've got, I've got an absolutely clear view of them. I am quite sure that people will get a greater pleasure, not only from knowing how things work, but from being able to take competent decisions about their own life. Uh, I mean, you ought to be able to know how to repair a fuse. Um, you ought to be able to know roughly what goes wrong with your car when something goes wrong with it. I confess I'm not very good at that myself. But, but you ought to have some idea as to, as to the way these things work. And, and that is science. The point is that this kind of ignorance means we don't understand what science can tell us and what it cannot. And that is serious because science is used by journalists and especially politicians to persuade us that they are right. The issue is no longer a question of the safety of British beef. The best available evidence demonstrates that British beef and beef products can be safely eaten by consumers both here and around the world. Do you believe him? You need to know a bit about science to be able to answer that. I don't mean the latest facts about BSE research, but at least enough about scientific method to know that you cannot claim certainty from science. Science can never say the evidence demonstrates, for instance, that beef is definitely safe to eat. It can only offer probabilities and explain where current evidence points. It's then up to us as individuals to decide what to do with that information. What's very important, I think, is that these decisions aren't left to scientists or politicians or committees of scientists and politicians and bishops. Um, those aren't the people that should be making these decisions. Society as a whole should be. And I don't think society can make those decisions in a sensible way unless they have a basic understanding about the principles of science, not the details, but the principles. This shouldn't be anything to worry about. Despite the headlines, science isn't only or even usually about dangers and difficulties. On the contrary, the more you find out about science, the more you realize that it can be positively inspiring. There are two sorts of science, non-stick frying pan and supernova. People used to justify the space race because you got non-stick frying pans as a spin-off, which I think is a bit like justifying music by saying that it's good exercise for the violinist's right arms. This, on the other hand, is a classic example of the kind of science that really excites me. You won't get any non-stick frying pans here, but what you will get is something that, for my money, is far more valuable. An approach to the most distant reaches of the universe and to the most profound questions that the human mind can ask. This is Britain's largest radio telescope at Jodrell Bank near Manchester. The surface area of the dish is an acre and it's capable of receiving radio signals from planets and stars millions of light years away. It is a key that unlocks some of the secrets of the universe. What a pleasure, what a privilege to have a chance to unlock one of those secrets. A colleague of mine had. Hi, Chris. 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 Hi,
Chris. Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell is now a world-renowned astronomer. When she was still a graduate student in her twenties, she made the kind of scientific leap most scientists can only dream of. She discovered a completely new kind of star, and its discovery revolutionized our understanding of the universe. Nice, Chris, thanks. This was her toolkit in those days, a radio telescope in Cambridge which she'd helped to build herself. It recorded radio signals from objects at the very edges of the universe, as well as signals from local radio stations, electric motors and the like. Her job was to pick out the star signals from the man-made rubbish. One day she was deep into a three mile long printout of all this confusing information when a strange signal, a quarter of an inch long, caught her eye. It was pretty close to the limits of detectability and I didn't quite know what to make of it because it didn't look totally like one of the distant quasars and it somehow didn't look really like the locally generated interference. When she amplified the scrappy signal, she found a series of pulses one and a third seconds apart. It was unlike anything she'd seen before. She and her supervisor, Professor Anthony Hewish, were instantly faced with a puzzle. The new signal was full of contradictions. It's quite fast. It's too fast to be a star. So it's small. But because it's accurate, it's got great reserves of energy. It's not noticing that it's sending out radio wave after radio wave after radio wave. It's not drooping or giving up in an exhausted manner. It's not running down in any sense. So it's got vast reserves of energy, so it's big. So it's big and it's small. And we couldn't fathom that out for quite a while. We did for a while wonder if it was little green men signalling to us and they would have been little green men on a planet which was going round their sun. And we did tests to try and establish this. They couldn't solve the problem. Then, months later, she stumbled across another scrappy signal. If she could get this amplified, perhaps she would find the answer. This was the 21st of December and I was about to go on Christmas holiday. And it was about three o'clock in the morning when this bit of scruffy sky was due to be visible to the telescope. She got to the telescope just a few minutes before three. But it was cold and the machinery wasn't working. It wasn't even recording man-made interference. Well, I breathed on it and I uttered unladylike words at it and I flicked switches and I think I maybe even applied a foot to it in fury. And I got it to work at full sensitivity for five minutes and it was the right five minutes and it was on the right setting and in came blip 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 not one and a third seconds apart this time one and a quarter seconds apart and from a totally different bit of the sky and not only is it very exciting but it kills the little green men because you don't have two lots of little green men on opposite sides of the universe both deciding to signal to planet earth at the same time in a rather silly way. It's a new kind of star. Great. Jocelyn had discovered a pulsar, the remains of an exploded star. Its invisible corpse was a spinning lump of prodigiously dense matter, crushed to a fraction of its former size. A pulsar the size of Wembley Stadium would weigh as much as the Earth. It was the nearest thing then discovered to a black hole and it opened a new chapter in our understanding of the universe. Surely it's better to explore stars with telescopes than horoscopes, yet many still look to the paranormal for their answers, as we'll see.